was a little different this year than we're used to, but I hope to uh, energize you and get you excited about thinking about churn, which is not typically something that sales focuses on, but to see how sales and churn are related. So why don't we jump into this? Um, I have a question to ask. Has anyone ever experienced something like this before? Or you thought you were buying one thing, but in reality, your expectation didn't match? Well, all of us have at some point. And it's not only disappointing and frustrating, but it leaves you with a firm resolve. And that resolve is to never buy from that company again. And once that decision is made not to do business with a company anymore, you've just become a churned customer. And as a churned customer, you and every other churned customer have now had an impact on a company's profitability. Churned customers are the Achilles heel of every business. You might be asking, what is churn? Simply put, churn is when a customer stops being a customer. They stop buying from you. They leave. Okay, I have a question for you. Feel free to answer this in your minds. In your opinion, do you think a 95% customer retention rate is good? And I'm asking this because I want to show you the flip side of a 95% customer retention rate. So just keep your answer in your mind. The flip side of a 95% customer retention rate is a 5% churn rate. So you keep 95% of the customers you have and 5% leave. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, not quite, and here's why. Churn is insidious. As you can see from this graph, the red line on the bottom is a 5% churn rate. And you can see that over time, it has a staggering effect on customer growth. And here's the reality if you're looking to grow a company with a monthly recurring revenue with a 5% churn rate. First of all, you're losing 50% of your customers each year. Yep, over, the, over a 12-month period, 50% of your customers will churn at a 5% churn rate. Second, you've lost all the money, time, and effort spent in acquiring and converting those churned customers. No matter if the business is low-touch or high-touch, money, time, and effort were spent in acquiring and converting those customers. And each time a customer churns, that money, time, and effort are gone. Third, if you want to grow the business, you now have to work four times as hard. The first is to acquire a new customer just to replace the churned one. The second is to replace the exact amount of lost revenue that the churned customer provided. The third is to acquire a brand new customer to add to your overall customer count. So this means if you're looking to grow the company, you need to add new customers on top of the ones you lost. And lastly, it's to add to your monthly recurring revenue count. So that means adding even more revenue on top of the existing revenue. So when looked at it this way, a 5% churn rate, rate when you're trying to grow a company, so that means you're losing 50% of your customers each year and it costs 4X to grow and replace them, it suddenly doesn't look so good. So there's no doubt from this chart that it shows the pain of churn not only in terms of profitability, but in terms of time and effort. And sales has a big part to play in whether a customer churns or not. Now, before we get into exactly how sales is involved, let's frame this discussion. And the easiest way to frame this discussion is by showing you how the customer journey is a lot like a romantic relationship. Okay, you'll see where sales fits into this framework. The first is dating. Okay, this is marketing, lead gen, fun, getting to know each other, developing the relationship. Outbound sales and cold calling also land here. You're determining whether the relationship has enough to go forward. And if it looks like there might be a fit, then you start interacting more frequently. The questions get more personal. You know how this goes. The dating period might be fast or it might be slow. And during this time, both parties are getting to know each other better and they get a sense of how the relationship might play out in the future. Marriage, this is where the commitment is made. And while it's exciting for both parties, this is the place where the seeds of a strong or poor relationship are made. Strong marriages are built on clear expectations and some frank discussions right from the start of the commitment. Poor marriages are built on ambiguity and uncertainty. There's often a lack of communication around expectations and how the relationship will progress. 
Signing the deal and closing the account is just like the act of getting married. It's a commitment to a new relationship. But just like in the early stages of a marriage, the strength of the business relationship comes down to whether clear expectations are laid out or not. I call this the wandering eye phase. And we've all been in relationships at one time or another where we're starting to question the value of staying in the relationship. We can get bored, angry, frustrated, and there's the sense of wanting to take action. Just like in relationships and business, this is a particularly worrying stage. Your customers are no longer happy and they're starting to think your competitors might be better suited for them. If you don't catch your customers when they're in this stage and find out why they're unhappy, they will end up in the next stage, which is divorce. It's the end of the relationship. And for some, it can be liberating. For others, it can be very painful. It's no different in personal lives as it is in business. Some customers will be happy to churn. They won't even give you another chance. For others, they might want to stay with your company, but changes in their circumstances mean they have to walk away. Just like divorce, churn can be expensive and painful for both parties. So the critical role expectations play in churn. As we saw from this example, expectations play a big role in whether a customer churns or not. Now, thinking back to this framework, it's the dating and marriage stages where those expectations are clearly defined or not. In dating and marriage, there are expectations around finances, division of labor, childcare, and interactions with family and friends. In sales, there are expectations set around four things, and these expectations are around time, cost, value, and support. Looking at time, how long does it take for the customer to find value in the product? Customers have a problem and they usually want it fixed as soon as possible. Will they find value in the product in a few hours, days, weeks, or months? Unless it's explicitly stated, customers expect that it will take the shortest amount of time possible to find value in the product. Customers need to know when they will receive this value so they can adjust their expectations of the product accordingly. Cost. How much does the product cost over the lifetime of the deal? Where the deal is monthly and recurring, this is usually fairly straightforward. Where this matters is where hidden costs or fees associated with the deal that aren't made transparent before the contract is closed. If customers aren't expecting these hidden costs or fees, it can be very jarring when they encounter them for the first time. And it also sows the seeds of mistrust. Value. What value is the customer to receive? And is it measurable? And how will that value solve the problem or problems they're experiencing? This is where social proof, case studies, and testimonials convey the main value proposition. The effectiveness of those sales tools depends on how well they align with the goals the prospective customer is seeking to attain. Align the right tool to the right prospect, and as customers, they're more likely to be happy. Use the wrong tool and the risk of churn increases. And support. How are customers supported as they onboard with the product? What type or level of support is available? Is there a dedicated rep to support them? Or is it just email and phone support? Customers need to know how they will be supported once the deal is closed. Will they have to jump through hoops to get help or will it be easy? And having, customer, having poor customer support experiences is one of the big reasons customers churn. When expectations around these four areas are clearly defined, the likelihood of a customer experiencing something vastly different from those expectations is diminished. However, if even one of these four areas does not clearly have clearly defined expectations, the reality the customer ex will experience may be vastly different. So the greater the difference between the expectations laid out by the sales rep and the reality the customer experiences, the more likely they are to churn. We'll talk a little bit later about how churning customers affect sales directly. But first, here's a great description of how the, the expectations around support and value were vastly different from those uh, uh, encountered in reality. And here's what I mean. So a few years ago, when I was just starting my consulting business, I really wanted my business to be successful. And I'd heard a lot about growing my mindset. 
So in my research to understand more, I came across a guy who is known internationally as a mindset expert. Being the knowledge-loving student that I am, I consumed nearly all of his hundreds of videos within a two-week period. This guru has a six-day event, which he holds several times a year. And there's very little info about this event, and I, being as curious as I am, wanted to know more about it, so I booked a call with his sales team. <clears throat> the sales associate, Arash, was great. We met once a month over the course of three months to sell me into the event. Excuse me. <clears throat> Arash told me that many attendees found the event to be life-changing, and we would also have a final social event at this guru's home where we could take pictures with him and see his private studio where he recorded his videos. I was also told that I'd be assigned a coach who uh, would meet with me before and during the event. Then after the event, this coach was going to support me in helping me to implement what I had learned during the six days. Now, coaching is something I highly value, so I was excited to know that I would be supported before, during, and after this life-changing event. Arash also told me that I was going to learn a lot of new things throughout those six days. And being a lifelong learner, this is what actually sold me into the event. I paid a staggering $22,000 just to register for this event. I was really excited the first day, and I managed to find two other women who I ended up hanging out with throughout the six days. Eventually, we added one more, and there were four of us. Unfortunately, the disappointment crept in early. From nearly the beginning of day one, I was really disappointed that what we were taught was all the ideas that were available for free on this guru's YouTube channel. By the early afternoon, I wanted to meet my coach and I wanted to find out if things were going to change or not. I was not impressed. So for nearly two hours, I searched high and low in this 200 plus person audience to finally find my coach. And then I had to practically beg him for 10 minutes to meet me. I eventually got 10 minutes of his time and in our 10 minute meeting, I told him I wasn't impressed with what I was witnessing so far. He looked me straight in the eye and told me that what I was learning was merely review to lay the foundation for the rest of the week. Okay, day two. I go into the event with a positive expectation that we would be learning something new. However, it was simply more of the same, a review of the free online content I'd already viewed. Now, day three. I'm getting upset now. I've actually started to question whether I should stay or not. The other ladies in our little group of four had similar feelings. We were starting to get angry. We were starting to feel duped. And during one of the coffee breaks, I managed to spot my coach and I cornered him at the coffee station. He assured me that by day four, the networking sessions would make up for all the review we were experiencing. And I was told by him that it would be worth staying. Just like day one and day two, day three was another full day of review. Day four, there's no way I could get a refund now, even if I wanted to, because I passed the halfway point. Sure enough, we broke into groups and networked, but it wasn't a life-altering experience I'd been told this was for most people. So I tried to get as much out of the networking as possible since I'd already invested so much time and money. But by the end of day four, yeah, I was out. I knew that I would never purchase another product from this company again. No matter the fact that we actually got a really big discount on their other programs because we participated in this event, I wasn't going to give them another nickel. I had churned. For me, the expectations around value I'd receive during the event in terms of changing my life and the promised support and the promised coaching support before after the event never materialized in reality. Of the four of us who met and stuck together during those four days, only two of us actually spoke to our coaches while we were there. One woman never even met her coach at the event nor afterward. The expectations in those sales talks were set, but they never materialized. I was left disappointed, angry, and feeling like a bit of a fool for having believed those expectations could happen. A couple months after the event, I still hadn't heard from my coach despite repeated emails I sent. I asked the company to remove me from all their mailing lists because I never wanted to hear from them again. And gratefully, I never did. So why does churn matter to sales? Here it is. The more customers that stay, the more opportunities there are to work with them to upsell, cross-sell, and renew. 
And they're also more likely to refer new business and offer positive word of mouth mentions. For existing customers, you've already done the hard work of acquiring and converting them. And as you know, this process can take weeks, months, or even years. The more customers you can help retain by properly shaping their expectations around time, cost, value, and support, the more likely they are to stay. And the more likely they are to stay, the more likely they are to buy again in upsells, cross-sells, and renewals. Plus, the longer they stay and the happier they are with the product, the more likely they are to speak positively of your company and to refer friends, family, and business associates to you. Long story short, the better you can manage a prospect's expectations around time, cost, value, and support, the more likely they are to stay. The more they stay, the better the chance that you can sell to them again. How do you manage prospects' expectations? Well, it's by using the right sales tools, social proof, case studies, and testimonials. Whether we like to admit it or not, we all buy on emotion. We're either seeking to move toward pleasure uh, or away from pain, and that is it. Facts, charts, metrics, they all help support the buying decision, but the real decision is made emotionally according to the outcome the prospect wants to achieve. And the social proof case studies and testimonials you use when you speak with prospects ties into those emotional outcomes. As humans, we remember stories we hear far better than we remember facts. In one study where people listened to a presentation, one week later, only 5% could remember facts from that presentation. But one week later, 63% of them could recall a story from that same presentation. Testimonials, case studies, and social proof are all stories you tell. They take prospective customers on the journey of where current customers used to be, how your product helped them, and where they're at now. That's a simple journey your testimonials, case studies, and social proof are taking prospective customers on. Here I am with this problem. Here you offer a solution that can help. Now my problem is solved or being solved. All the facts, metrics, and charts help support the simple story. Problem, solution, which is your product or service, and then problem solved. The reason why the simple story works is because we can all relate to stories. Your prospective customers have a problem. In talking to them and telling them about current customers who experience the same problem, the prospect can emotionally relate. Now there's a connection, right? And the connections aren't based on thoughts. The connections are based on feelings. Your sales assets, the social proof, testimonials, case studies, help take the prospective customer on a journey, both a logical one, in terms of facts, metrics, metrics and charts, and an emotional one, problem, solution, problem solved. Prospective customers will remember these stories and they help shape the expectations they have of the product and the outcomes they can achieve. And this is where the types of stories, social proof, case studies, and testimonials you use will help manage the expectations of your prospect. Pick the right selling tool to manage the prospect's expectations so that the reality and the vision you're selling them are similar, the more likely they are to stay as a customer. Pick the wrong selling tools to manage the the prospect's expectations so their reality and the vision you're selling them are different, the more likely they are to churn. More more customers churning equals fewer opportunities for upsells, cross-sells, renewals, lots of referrals, and negative word of mouth mentions. It also means six to seven times more money, time, and effort trying to acquire and convert new customers instead. The easiest and cheapest way to increase your sales, keep more of the customers you have. So how do you determine which selling tool to use? If you think back to my story about the six-day event with the guru, you can see that As the difference between my expectation and my reality grew apart, the more unhappy I became. And the more unhappy I became, the closer I moved to churning. If I were to ask you right now what it is you think sales reps actually do, there might be a bunch of different thoughts that jump to your mind. So you help or you sell, and those are certainly correct. But sales does one thing really well, and it's not obvious what that one thing is. But once I say it, you'll totally get it. The one thing that sales does really well is what I call detective and caddy work. 
For the detective work, I'm not talking about researching a prospective customer, although that is detective work. I'm talking about this type of detective work. And though, and um, this is where those in sales really excel. Discovery. You're discovering the true problems the prospect has, which, as you know, may or may not be what the prospective customer says their problem is. Understanding. You're understanding the prospect's perspective on their problem. How badly does the prospect think this issue is? And how deeply do they think it affects them? Essentially, you're determining whether the problem is urgent or not in the prospect's mind. And determining. You're determining the outcomes the prospect is looking for. What is it they are truly looking to achieve? The caddy part is just like a caddy is to a golfer. The caddy carries around the golf clubs of the golfer. They assess the golfer's situation and they factor in all sorts of elements like wind, slope, distance, and topography. And then they choose the right club for that particular shot. The sales rep is just like a caddy once the detective work is done. You're looking to choose the right selling tool, which are social proof case studies and testimonials for this particular prospective customer's exact situation to help facilitate the sale. The better the detective work a sales rep does, the better they can choose the right selling tool. Again, social proof testimonials or case studies for the prospect. And the more aligned the sales tool is with the prospect's problem and the outcomes they seek, the better the prospect can emotionally relate to those tools. The more they emotionally relate, the more likely they are to buy. They are seeking an emotional change from pain to relief or simply moving toward more pleasure. And the more they emotionally relate to those tools, the greater the expectation that they too will experience those outcomes. The greater the expectation of those outcomes by the prospect, the greater the likelihood they will churn if those expectations are not met. Just think back to my story where the expectations and reality were vastly different. Detective work, so choosing the right selling tools, social proof case studies, and testimonials. If there's a good sales tool alignment with the prospect's problem and outcomes, the prospect can emotionally relate. They're more likely to buy. However, the greater the expectation of those outcomes for themselves, the greater the likelihood of churn if reality doesn't meet those expectations. So said in a different way, The selling tools you use will help shape a prospect's expectations of the ability of of the product to solve the problem they have. If the selling tools you use to sell them into the product, like social proof, case studies, and testimonials, don't align with what they experience in reality, they'll be more likely to churn. And a big challenge you face in sales is that the problem needs and outcomes of your customers are always changing. So to better align your prospect's expectations with the reality of being a customer, you need to keep your selling tools, social proof, case studies, and testimonials as current as possible. Everything in the world abruptly changed when the coronavirus became a pandemic. Everyone was thrown into survival mode and most businesses scrambled to recalibrate their goals and many struggled to stay in business. The early weeks of the pandemic, no one wanted to be sold to unless it it was to help with a desperate need. So companies struggled on how best to serve customers and sales teams switched priority from selling to helping their existing customers cope. After After the initial first weeks of lockdown shock, businesses started to rethink priorities and goals for the quarter and for the year and customer needs changed. In some cases, it was 180 degree swing in direction. Companies that quickly shifted to the new needs of their customers were better able to serve them and retain them. Sales tools like social proof, case studies, and testimonials had to be created or modified to accommodate these changing priorities and the needs of prospects and customers. Much like discussed earlier, prospect and customer expectations around time, cost, value, and support needs to be shifted to adapt so their reality more closely matches what they're being told. The more closely aligned their expectations and reality are, the more likely they are to stay as customers. So where do you get the best best info about your customers? And in asking this question, I'm sure you're thinking the obvious answer, answer, which is from my customers. And of course, you're right. But this info isn't necessarily gathered by you. Some of the best intel you get on uh, on your customer experiences once the deal is closed 
is actually from elsewhere in your company. And that's namely from customer support. So just bear with me a second while I explain this. We've talked about the how expectations are set in the dating and marriage stages. And these are expectations, again, around time, cost, value, and support. We've also talked about the selling tools you use, social proof, case studies, and testimonials. These tell stories which help shape those expectations through the emotions of the prospect. Once you've gone through the detective stage and discovered what the prospect's issue truly is and the outcome the prospect wants, you move on to the caddy stage. Now you're picking the right sales tools to get that strong emotional tie from the prospect that will move them closer to closing the deal. The more closely they can emotionally relate to the stories of the selling tools you choose, the more likely they are to expect those same outcomes for themselves. But if those outcomes aren't met in reality, those customers are more likely to churn. More churned customers means lost upsells, cross-sells, renewals, referrals, and negative word-of-mouth mentions. But there is a way for you to more closely align your sales tools, those stories found in social proof case studies and testimonials, so that you greatly reduce the likelihood the customer will churn. And that means you protect all the time and effort you spent in acquiring and converting that prospect into a customer. And the way that's done is by strengthening the stories in your selling tools so that the expectations you set through those tools are more closely aligned with the reality the prospect will experience once they become a customer. And it's your customer success or customer service team that has that valuable info for you. Customer success is responsible for the 90-day adoption rule. And this is the first 90 days after a prospect becomes a customer. These first 90 days are the most critical time when customers are most likely to churn. It's because this is where those expectations around time, cost, value, and support that were set during the dating and marriage stages of the relationship are put to the test against the reality the customer is actually experiencing. Now, you've heard this many times before already in this talk. The more aligned those expectations are with reality, the more likely the customer is to stay. The less aligned, the more likely they are to churn. Even the best customer success manager or customer service representative cannot overcome the chasm between high expectations and a poor experience in reality. If a sales rep over promises and the reality under delivers, customers will walk away. Just think back to the last time this happened to you, where you stopped doing business with a company because your expectations didn't meet reality. It could be as small as purchasing a pack of gum that looks great, but in reality, the taste may be so different from what you expected that you never purchase that brand again, or even right up to something big like staying in a hotel that didn't match your expectations. The point is when expectations and reality are far apart, there's pretty much nothing that can be done to overcome that chasm. How can customer success help you sell better? Customer success has a unique position of dealing with customers in the early days and beyond. And this means they have firsthand knowledge about the expectations customers have when they're using your product. They can tell you the top three things that customers contact about, contact them about. Then, or they can tell you how quickly and easily those issues can be solved. They can tell you exactly what your customers expect and the outcomes they're seeking. Now, if you take this knowledge, those top three things customers contact support about, and put it in your selling tools, like the social proof case studies and testimonials, you can manage those expectations. And if it takes a certain length of time for customers to find specific specific value in the product, tell them about it. Talk to prospects about what most of your customers experienced in their first 90 days to help manage the prospect's expectations about the reality of those first 90 days. By talking to prospects in advance of some of the challenges they might experience in onboarding and normalizing this by talking about what current customers experience, it will help your prospects feel more comfortable when they experience the same things. Remember the journey your selling tools are taking prospects on? This one, here I am with this problem, Here you offer a solution that can help, and now my problem is solved or being solved. It's the same type of journey, but now it's focused on the first 90 days as a customer. The more your prospects can emotionally align with what your current customers experienced in those 90 days, 
the more likely they are to stay. And you know how this goes, the more likely they are to stay, the more likely they are to buy again. Customer success can give you that intel. And your prospects who become customers will thank you for it at some point, whether they do it out loud by telling you or telling others in social media, and even silently in their minds. By closely aligning their expectations with reality, you've just vastly increased their experience and laid down a more positive perception of the company. You've got such a great role to play in setting the expectations of what uh, prospects will encounter when they become customers. And as you've seen, the better you can align those expectations with reality, the more likely a customer will choose to stay. More retained customers means more opportunities for upsells, cross-sells, renewal, renewals, and more second-order revenues from positive word-of-mouth mentions and referrals. The easiest way to help customers to stay is to manage the expectations of prospects through the stories in your selling tools, the social proof, the case studies, the testimonials, including what they can expect in their first 90 days as a customer. It doesn't take much to manage those expectations, but the rewards are certainly worth it. Being great at sales is decided more by the intelligence of your approach and the thoroughness of your preparation than pure sales ability. Get the intel from customer success. Better align expectations and reality in your selling tools, social proof, those case studies and testimonials, and watch as more of your customers stay and buy with upsells, cross-sells, renewals, referrals, and positive word-of-mouth mentions over and over again. So that's the presentation. (laughs) So do we have some questions uh, for Anita on the presentation or general questions on churn? You can unmute yourself and ask, or we can you can ask in chat and we can relay it on. Mm-hmm. I understand that it's um, what I laid on is maybe different than what you thought going through the actual sort of uh, logistics of churn or how it happens. But this being, you know, sales leaders and sales reps, I really wanted to to mention how important what you do affects what happens on the back end once prospects actually become customers. And for me, um, I find this really exciting that you guys have such a a unique role to play in this. And so um, it may have seemed a little different perhaps than what you expected, which is a perfect example then. Um, So yeah, happy to facilitate a a discussion. We have have a question uh, from Luke. Yeah, good morning, Anita, and morning, everyone. Thanks, Anita, for the presentation. I I struggle often, and and as you were going through this, I very much um, adhere to the the feeling of owning that process from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. And I know that's the frustration of many salespeople or some who don't want to own it cradle to grave. They don't mind handing it, owning it up to a certain point and then having to hand it off. But I, I really like owning it cradle to grave, and maybe it's because I'm a control freak, and I want to make sure that they get that service that they've expected from us and, and from our teams. But the, the example that you highlighted, the bad experience, what, if anything, would you do differently, and what did you learn from that, that next time this is what I would do in a situation to, to manage that differently for your own self? I think the biggest, so you're talking about my story with yeah, that you're, the negative experience message. you had. That's right. Yeah. I think part of the reason why the sting was so badly as well was the amount of money I had spent um, yes. to join that event. Um, I, th- looking back, I think there were a couple of things. It was the first time I had ever made such a heavy investment in uh, a, it wasn't quite a workshop. It was sort of similar because it was over so many days. I think his ex, he set those expectations really high. It was often life-changing event. It's amazing. It was, he really didn't say like, this is the process you're going to go through. And the first day, first few days, we're just going to review stuff to, to lay the foundation. So the first day going in there and I'm listening and I'm like, oh my God, this is exactly what I heard in all those videos I consumed. It already started to sow those seeds of um, disappointment. And 
the, of course, the longer the event went on, the more I got of this. And then you hit this tipping point where it's no matter what you do, I'm the, the person's out or they've turned in their minds if they haven't quite physically turned yet. And that had happened for me fairly early on. And it's because he didn't um, lay those expectations out. I think many people perhaps who attend the event are different than I am, but I don't know. I found three other women who are much like me. Uh, we'd never paid so much for an event before. And so it was, that was really what upset us. And this promise coaching, there was no coaching. We didn't get coaching. You spoke to somebody for a few minutes and that was considered um, coaching. So I think with those two things, like now going into this, I'm listening. This is actually, this event is what pushed me to learn more about sales and marketing because I was, I was really upset after this event um, for a long time. I now see it as a, a learning experience, but that's where this, this became such a, a big point around expectations and reality. And we don't realize when we're selling that we are taking them on this journey, that it's, it really is an emotional one. So if expectations are high and people are really excited um, and reality doesn't meet that, there's almost nothing sometimes you can do. Like even just think of going to a restaurant and maybe even it's your favorite restaurant and you're used to having a certain level of, of service or how the meal tastes and then suddenly it doesn't taste like that. You're disappointed. And if that chasm's really big, you might actually decide I don't want to come back. And even if they offer you another free meal, it's often not enough to over overcome that. So I think that that would be that would be the way if I was um, a rash selling me into this event, I would have been a little more realistic about what it was like versus just the hype of it. Um, but I have to say, though, Luke, when I went to the event, it was all hypey. I was like, what? <laughs> Like, what? this is not Tony Robbins I went to see. This is, you know, somebody else. But it was so incongruent with who this person was that I was like, what, what am I in here? And it, it felt like a lot of smoke and mirrors and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, apparently that's how they do it. They can hold this event. If I think I said there were like over 200 people there. They hold this event sometimes up to six times a year. So it's obviously very lucrative for them. Wow. Yeah. 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 It kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So nope. um, did that answer your question? Yeah, a little bit. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. If it only answered it a little bit, what part, what part? Were well, you just, I, I guess what's, I mean, when we look at um, even as salespeople and we provide either guarantees or milestones within our contract agreements, or, you know, when our sales reps, if you're managing a team and you find out that someone is promise something they shouldn't have or they've done something an offer in writing or something I mean what I think milestones would you suggest you know people put in place to protect either themselves as a buyer or even yourself as the as you know the seller oh that's a good question I'm actually not sure I'm not sure I think that how do you do it right now what's your process so for us, and, and I guess it's probably unique to every product, um, yeah. what I do is, is we're an IT recruiting and staffing firm. So we're selling staffing services. And in essence, I hate to say it, but people are our product and we're selling people in one sense. Uh, but we do wrap guarantees around our placement services. Um, so uh, for us, there's, you know, within either a probationary time frame three months, six months, whatever the client is, is agreed to. If the candidate doesn't work out, either they leave or the client decides they're not working and they terminate the, the, the individual, we'll either offer um, a credit or a refund. Um, most firms in our competitive space offer just a credit uh, or a replacement on a future search. Um, our methodology and our process is to offer either to the client and it's the client's decision because if they didn't like our service in the first place, I've already got their money and then I'm forcing them to use me again. Mm -hmm. And if they're not confident in that, then, you know, how confident are they that I've already got their money and are they going to work? Am I going to work? Or are they confident that myself or my team is going to work just as aggressively to, to backfill that, you know, vacancy? So that's why we offer both in that sense. And very rarely, um, 
in my history have we had to actually refund it um, because the client has been happy with something and we get that opportunity to refill it. Okay. I think, and, and we don't play in that space, but in our, in our industry as well, retain search um, on executive level positions is fairly common. The challenge with, with most retain search agreements is that uh, you have a one shot deal to make it happen. If it doesn't work out, you're not giving the client the money back and you will never do business with that client again. Mm -hmm. if it doesn't work out. So we don't do a lot of retained search, but I think that's one of the pitfalls of retained search. And I'm wondering how that applies to other verticals on these, this group here in terms of their product and their milestones and things. Yeah. I don't, I don't know who else we have in the call. Is there anybody else that could um, speak to that? Anybody? Uh, hey, it's Mark here. Um, there's a few things that, um, I know when we're dealing with customers on the SaaS model, so we have a client right now that provides a 60 day money back guarantee. So it's a good way for them to make sure, you know, that, you know, and already on a SaaS model, if you're on a monthly SaaS model, that's, I think it's the ultimate customer service uh, guarantee because if you don't, you're not happy with it, you can cancel if you don't, if it's a month to month commitment. So, but that's one thing that they do is they provide that as a guarantee if the expectations aren't meeting the, um, what the customer is doing now they're they're a small team so they can it's almost as luke said cradle the grave so they can the same people are dealing with them up front as as towards you know as the implementation and the ongoing so you know that's helpful for them you know that the challenge i think for for them is not going to be sustainable they're going to have to hire more people on the customer support or you know the customer success team because they won't be able to have the sales people or the entrepreneur dealing with the, the before and after so yeah. Um, Luke, just a quick question. How often are you checking in or with both the client and then the, um, the person that was placed in the position? Yeah, on a regular basis. So we do both perm search and contract, but the mile and the milestones are slightly different. So we've got a process that we built called a CSC, which is the consultant service call or the client service call. And so it's, it's a number of touch points either just before they're starting to even make sure that their onboarding has been handled well by the company we've placed them at and they're all good to go for Monday and, you know, first day or two in one week in, um, the candidate is more frequent than the client side. Um, mm -hmm. the client side is usually, um, a couple of weeks in, and then one month and, and every month for a couple of months, just once they have deliverables, that's when they can really evaluate how that person's been doing in the role. Okay. Um, so a couple of weeks in for the client side, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks in. Do you think that there might be an opportunity to add just a really quick call just to see? Because there's so many things you're evaluating for, right? Someone could be really competent in their job, but they don't fit culture, right? Yep. Yep. And if they don't, if they're not a good cultural fit, it doesn't really matter um, how well they do their job. There's a bit Agreed. of a mismatch. So I'm wondering if it's, if it might be useful just to slip in a, like a really short, maybe just 10 minute call to get sort of that first sense of what they think this person's like, whether they, they've actually delivered something or not and see if that um, culture fit. Because yeah, again, they so I'm, as time's gone on culture and fitting into the right culture has almost superseded what people, you know, can actually perform in the job. So wondering if that might be helpful um, to manage those expectations as well, instead of just having them deliver something without actually addressing that. Um, yeah, no, the, the, the touch point with the client side is more frequent on, um, uh, well, it, it's more, it, it it, it is definitely in the first week um, on the client side as well for that cultural type fit side. It's not on the deliverable side. Um, and again, quite often some of the clients we're dealing with um, aren't necessarily actually great managers. And so, um, or they've never managed a contractor, for example, and they don't understand the difference between how they should manage a contractor versus a perm employee because they may be getting direction from HR that may or may not be accurate um, about giving feedback, for example. So we will take what we get from the candidate and also discuss it with a client and making sure that, hey, so-and-so is feeling this. I want to make sure you're reaching out to them and giving them the feedback that they need, especially on a contract side when you're paying a, an hourly rate on someone, you want to make sure you're maximizing what you're getting out of that individual. Um, there is some issues in our industry about pseudo employees 
employment. So okay. um, some managers we need to coach more than others in terms of giving feedback to the contractor to make sure they're performing up to what that person needs them to do. Yeah. Would something like a, a really short series of videos help with that? With, um, I am, let's say, a new manager who's never had someone in that position? Would that I help? would say in a perfect world, yes. However, everybody's overwhelmed with too many emails and too many things to do these days. Yeah. And so really, it's that personal touch point. If I'm reaching out or one of my salespeople is reaching out and having the, the five, 10 minute conversation about it and, and, and making them aware of it. And if they, in fact, want more information on, yeah, we'll have, we'll book another session with them to talk okay, about what great. they should consider. Great. Great. I think at some point, like there's, you can only do so much as you can, yep. especially when you're dealing with someone who's a new manager, who's never had a, a contractor in before, that it's not your job to educate them and teach them beyond just that little bit to, to make this situation comfortable for both parties. Um, sounds like you're doing everything, everything you can. Um, yeah. So, we, yeah. so we, have an, we have another question in from the chat, and this is from okay. Randy, who you, who you know. Um, uh, so he mentioned he asked if uh, if it's a, if it's a new startup and um, you know they don't maybe they don't have a lot of testimonials or case studies or social proof. Um, you know what you know what's um, what's your recommendation on how they can help with that upfront setting expectations? Mm, thanks for the question, Randy. Um, I. <laughs> The best way to go about this, whatever little bit you have, and I think being transparent is the best way to do it and, and let them know we don't have a lot of case studies or testimonials, but of, the, of our clients or customers that have gone through, this is the experience they have had. And of course, as you amass more experience, uh, have more customers go through, then you get a wider breadth of um, experiences that you can then use in your selling tools. But until that point, sometimes it's just best to be honest. Um, I was just reading, or even I did this with, with my business with when I was first starting out and I didn't have that experience. I had no clients at that point was I ran a beta program and I was very clear, like I'm going to be learning at the same time you're going to be learning your experience is going to be vastly different from my clients, you know, later on, once I gain this experience and people who were comfortable with being in a beta program were really okay with it and appreciated that. So I think that with an early startup, that's probably the best approach to go is, is let people know. And for people who like, I'm somebody who likes being in beta. I, I don't mind if things are buggy and clunky and sometimes they break. For me, that's the thrill of it. So I would gravitate towards something like that versus uh, other people who are a little more risk averse. They don't, they want things to be very stable before they use them. They might choose to, to wait until that um, client base expands and then they can they can come in. So I would just say to be transparent in those early days and and let them know that hey, we don't have a lot here, but what we what our customers or clients that we have right now do experience, this is it. And if this feels comfortable comfortable for you, then um, you know we'd love to take you on board. Did that answer your question, Randy? Yeah, thanks, Anita. I was. Um... Yeah, just thinking about some of our clients where um, they may have a solution in one vertical and then we're helping them look at a different area. So it's yeah. like, hey, we have this great case study about, um, but it doesn't really apply to your situation. So sometimes we have to make the, the translation almost of the case study into a different industry. Yeah. So in that sense, it's um, giving a bit more... Uh, background or, or talking through it or or making the connections for them that might not be be obvious because they don't see it they don't have like you said the emotional connection to it because well that's not my story mm -hmm. those are those are guys in the construction field and I'm in uh, and I'm in um, you know um, HR or something like that something different so so we have to kind of make that um, the translation for them so um, okay yeah that's good thank you I was just going to add one more thing, um, and this is, again, a really great way to do it, is if you know that they're going to be going into a particular vertical, is reach out to companies that are like the uh, target customers 
and just ask for if whoever that um, target individual is. So if it's a CRO or CEO and just say, hey, we're moving from this this vertical to this one. Uh, you know, you're well respected in the industry. Could I interview you for a couple minutes and find out what you think of this idea? And then that way you can start getting some of the, the language for one that they specifically uh -huh. use in that vertical. And the second is that emotional element and how they think. How would you work through this problem? Or if I were to come with this idea, how, how would you implement it in your business? And like a 15 minute phone call is remarkably helpful. You get like even three or four of those and that will overcome that challenge you have of trying to provide that information in their language that they will relate to so that that emotional tie can be made. So um, it's certainly worth reaching out if you can, like I said, or, or get the company to reach out to three or three or so different companies and just ask ask if you can do a quick interview. And I'm always surprised at how willing people are to do this. Uh, and can, I, can I just add a point here? This is Rich from Flickly. Um, hey, and Randall, you're, uh, the way that we approach, so we produce animations um, for businesses like business explainer videos. And sometimes clients say to us, or sometimes prospects say to us, you know, um, well, can you show us videos that you've done that's or specifically in our vertical. And what I do is, you know, I might not have that, even though we've done like over a thousand videos, we might not have that. And even if we did, it probably wouldn't be what they're expecting anyway. So what I do is I focus on the outcome and I say, well, look, if you watch these three videos and if you get, or this one video, 15 seconds of this one video, and if you get what it is, um, that we're talking about, then that means we've been able to communicate a message. And if what you're trying to do is this in this vertical, well, you're the experts, so you'll be able to guide us, but we'll be able to bring that idea to life. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I try to uh, reposition um, the conversation to what they're real, the answer that they're really looking for. Mm hmm. And that's the sort of detective work stage, right? Is what is what outcome are they looking to achieve? And I think that that's the hardest part, especially if they come to you and the problem they're experiencing isn't really the problem they have. And it's moving that conversation along. Um, thank you very much, Rich, for bringing that up, because I think it's it's something that a lot of companies, especially early on, experience. Um, with with not having necessarily that ex exact proof that they want. I think it's just like with anything, we just want reassurance that if I'm taking this risk and I'm putting my, my money in, that at the end, I'm going to get something that is helpful to me. Uh, Anita, at the beginning of, before we had the presentation on, you mentioned that you had, you had um, a tool that you were going to share with the group. So maybe you can, maybe you can talk through that and um, just so we have everybody still. Give me, um, let me, uh, let's see here. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen again. Can you guys see the guide I made? Did it come up? Yep. Okay, so this is just, um, you can see the URL above and Mark, he'll send it out afterwards as well. So, there's a direct download here, so no email, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, you can just go and have a quick look. And what I've done is just essentially summarize what we, what I talked about in this talk. But then I split this up. So this is specific for sales leaders to try to get that information from customer success or customer support over to um, sales, and that is to have actually the someone from customer success come and do a presentation and same for product. So to get a, for product, getting a good understanding of the new features or products that are coming down the pipeline that might be valuable to those prospects without again, overselling, but letting them know that if there's not quite a good fit, that this is coming. And the second with customer success, again, is really finding out what those big challenges are in those first 
90 days of uh, being onboarded and being a customer so that those expectations are really brought in line with reality. And then when your customers go through some of these bumps in the road, which they inevitably will, they realize, oh yeah, I was told by that this might happen and they don't feel that there's something wrong with them or that the product uh, necessarily isn't working for them. So um, that's for sales leaders and for sales reps, uh, it's the same thing. I have actually two sets of questions that you can ask. One is of product. So asking what's the number one issue customers have with our products and how are these being addressed if you don't know. And remember, things are always changing. So what may, may have been the case a year ago might not be the case now. Um, what's the number one feature or product re request customers have? Uh, you may know this again, but again, as things change, uh, maybe there's new ones that are emerging. And what features or products are due to roll out in the next three, six, uh, three and six months and one year? And then there's three similar questions for customer success. What is the number one issues uh, customers contact support about in their first 90 days of using the product? Again, that will really help lay out that uh, journey as a customer in those early days. And how long does it typically take for that issue to be resolved? And then what are the top three reasons the customers churn? And uh, hopefully you can get some of that feedback from customer su success, particularly the top three reasons why customers churn. Because again, um, there might just be something that you aren't seeing from your perspective that the customer experiences time and time again, but you don't necessarily hear back. And this is where customer success can be vastly helpful as they collect that exit, uh, either an exit survey or information from churned customers about their experience and what they could do better. So this is just sitting, like I said, on my website, there's the URL there. You can go there now and download it if you want. And um, it's just there again to, to help give you um, a little extra, a little extra support in managing those expectations and, and, you know, make that customer experience the best that it can be. And well, <clears throat> I'll send out uh, um, the link to the, to the site afterwards and uh, as well as um, the recorded, a link to the recorded presentation as well. That's great. That's great. So um, does anybody have anything else around churn and, and customer expectations? Again, it's, it's for, for some, this might be a bit of a stretch. I know one thing that we're really seeing in SaaS, and that is the rise of um, revenue operations or RevOps, which is starting to now bring together marketing, sales, customer success, and product under kind of one roof and breaking down a lot of those silos for this reason. Because what happens at the beginning of the journey, once they become a customer, if those expectations are not met, then they're likely to churn. So I know RevOps has been a, a real big thing in the last little while that people have been discussing. Um, but if you don't already have that structure in place, then uh, this is kind of how you how you go about doing it for yourself to um, better manage those expectations and, and keep them as customers because that's really what the ultimate goal is, is to keep these customers as long as possible. Actually, this is Rich again from Flickly. Um, I, I just had one, this is sort of uh, while they're still in the prospect phase and before they actually become customers, mm -hmm. is that uh, I found over the past, like we've always done a fairly good job at filtering uh, our clients. Uh, but last year we made some moves that really helped us choose which uh, clients are a fit. Uh, and even if somebody really wants to work with us, they might not be ready in their own business uh, uh, to work with us. So I found that being honest uh, and helpful uh, up front, even when that means to not take that client on, uh, has really helped us. Uh, once they are onboarded and um, yeah, so I, for what it's worth, uh, I think that really choosing who you work with uh, is, is really important. Absolutely. And 
there have been times where even myself, I've wanted to purchase a product and I wasn't ready. Like, let's say it was my, my business was too small at that point. If I had a really good experience with that company, I will refer them to others who might be ready, uh, like at that particular stage, because I've had such a good experience. And I, I wasn't even a customer, but this, t- this expectations and reality and, and setting those right from the beginning and all of those touch points in between makes a big difference in how um, a prospect perceives the, the company going forward. Like for me, there's, I may never become a customer of whatever it, company it was, but because they were transparent, they still supported me and helped me right through that journey of even figuring out that this this particular product wasn't a good fit for me i appreciated that enough that when um one of my business associates mentioned that you know they're in that particular phase or looking for this that i would suggest that company so i i think ha- have you noticed that you're getting more referrals as a result of doing that is have you heard anything rich uh, as a, I know a lot of people in this group, and I've said uh, lots of times that we've never really done any uh, marketing. It's always been repeat uh, and referral uh, business, yeah. and it, because that it's just really um, you know much more affordable customer acquisition, and you just it's just when you can deliver something that the client really wants. Or again, you know, we talk about the prospecting phase. If they're not the uh, the client that that is a fit for you, you're right. They will come back uh, eventually when they are ready, or they'll be sending other people. And I think that you know what you touched on earlier. Uh, you know, one of the reasons you were highly disappointed with that twenty two grand that just kind of went out the window was uh, that there was no honesty there. And I think that that honesty just really lays the path uh, forward. Uh, but first, you have to be honest with yourself before you can be honest with the uh, uh, the customers. Yeah. And I think that that's the, the biggest thing of all, right, is is being honest with ourselves and 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 also what how we want to act, how we want to be perceived, right? There's same company. I can speak with one rep and have a great experience and speak with another rep and not. Um, and so it's aligning as much as possible to the values of the brand, but also my, also personal values, right. As we're selling and and talking with clients, like there's been people that same thing I've turned down, um, because we're just not a good fit, but there's two ways that I could go about doing that. I can go, go about doing it where it's respectful and I wish them the best and always try to, to leave them, you know, with either, another company that might better serve them or a resource or something, or I can just abruptly say like, yeah, I don't think this is going to work and then just cut it off there. For me, it's an important to, to support that person. Cause again, you, you don't know, like they might become a client later on as their business grows, but they will, that positive word of mouth, the challenge is, is that it's very hard to trace. You can't really put a metric on it, but you know that it's out there and companies that have a lot of negative word of mouth experience, like just think when you go to Amazon and those five-star ratings, if the ratings are generally really low, that is essentially that word of mouth mention. And it's like, no, I'm not going to buy from this company. And you read the reviews and it's negative. But if you go to one of their competitors with the identical product, and there's a lot of positive mentions about the experience and the product, or if there was a problem, how the pro- how that problem was solved, like quickly, easily. Um, and then the, the person became, you know, happy with that experience that kind of stuff, like you can't measure it, but it's, it's huge. So I think again, doing what you mentioned and that's being able to filter out, but respectfully say, you know, maybe this isn't a good fit right now, but I can leave you with this. And and maybe if it, there is a time where it is a good fit, then, you know, you can come back and we'd be, we'd love to have you. So thanks for sharing that. That um, always makes me feel really great. <laughs> I love I love to hear about great customer experiences because we've all been customers and we know what crappy customer experiences are like. Uh, those like my my event there, 
it's often harder to define those real positive customer experiences, but that's where the real value lays. It takes more work, it takes more work, more honesty and, and more thought in, in laying them out. But boy, when you come across them it really makes you feel good. Do we have any additional questions for Anita? Okay. Well, thank, thank you um, everyone for attending, Hi. especially thanks to Anita for, uh, for sharing her information and spending time with us uh, today. I will send her an email with the additional, with the information we talked about. Um, thanks as well to Troy for helping get things organized. Uh, right now we were typically have our hiatus until the fall, um, which I expect we'll do. I'm assuming probably back in September, <laughs> we'll be doing more remote uh, presentations as well. So um, if anybody has any questions or has comments or thoughts on some different topics coming up, feel free to message me or another one of the organizers. And um, uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, and uh, have a have a good summer and a safe summer. And uh, hopefully we get to enjoy a little bit more and more uh, outside and a little bit more and more uh, getting together in the, in the months that proceed, so. Great, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Nina. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.